Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Black Shirt Breakdown. My name is Steve Mark. I'm a staff writer inside Nebraska, and he is Jay Foreman, our NFL veteran and former Nebraska Black Shirt. Jay, we have an uh, interior defensive lineman, uh, interior defensive line commit for the 2023 class at Nebraska, Sua Lafotu, six foot four, uh, 295 pounds, from a powerhouse out west, St. John's Bosco High School out in LA. Uh, Jay, um, this is a good addition because I think when right. you look at Nebraska's roster right now, one thing you kind of, one area that you kind of look at and maybe want more is the D lineman, right? The big guys, the 300 pounders, the interior guys, there's a lot, a lot of edge guys um, right. on the roster, but as for interior D line, I think that's, that's an area that maybe needed some work. Um, so when you first heard that Lafotu had, had uh, committed to Nebraska or your initial reactions? Well, I mean, it's good. Uh, you know, the more the merrier. Um, obviously, numbers wise and experience wise, the interior D line. I'm assuming the first, you know, three down linemen uh, don't have a lot of depth. You know, as far as what's on the roster or before the recruiting uh, cycle started. And so, I, you know, obviously, I think they addressed it. Obviously, in the high school ranks, which you know he is. Uh, but then, obviously, get you know Judy out of the portal. Yep. Um, you know, I think what 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 is probably well two things is appealing i guess to, to as a coach is one he was a washington commit and so um you know washington has a pretty good history of having you know pretty good defense alignment uh physical big physical guys that where they are able to you know be pretty effective early in their career and then also he comes from a good high school program and so you know as we get into the tape you see he does a couple things uh really well and and he and he plays to his weight you know as far as um, you know, he, you know, he plays pretty strong, uh, has pretty good effort. And so you can see why he's appealing to uh, well, any college, but then in particular in Nebraska that needs some good young help and maybe a young guy that could provide some spark if he can uh, get coached up and, in, in, uh, you know, learn the defense and, and the intricacies of playing in Big Ten football. Before we get into his tape, just a little bit of background, like you said, a former Washington Husky commit for about four months um, before he decommitted and then uh, picked the Huskers. But also had went through some injuries um, during his high school career. His sophomore, junior years, I think, were a little bit um, slowed down, which kind of impacted his recruiting. Um, but he he was healthy senior year and everything at St. John's Bosco. So um, overall, he's the 27th um, commit of the 2023 class for, for Nebraska, and he's a 26th high schooler because Kai Wallen came from the junior college ranks as well. Right. As for the interior D lineman, he's the fifth interior D lineman by my count. Um, joining Riley Van Poppel, Jason Machachok, who came over from the offensive side, um, Vincent Carroll Jackson from the East Coast, and then right. uh, Elijah, Elijah Judy um, out of the transfer portal, big 300 right. pounder from Texas A&M. So let's get into Lufotu's uh, tape here. Really interesting guy uh, to look at, Jay. Um, again, you're going to see him line up, um, maybe head up on the tackle and inside. Right. He's not going yeah. outside or anything. He's a true interior D lineman. Sure. You see him in a little bit of a, you know, it could be a five, four eye technique, maybe a five technique. Uh, you know, he's a big kid, you know, that jumps off, you know, right off tape, you know, he's got a big, strong lower half. Uh, you know, look, he finds his way to the ball. Um, you know, obviously a little bit of technique could be better, but I like his physicality uh, shooting his hands right off the get go. And so, you know, that when he plays, you know, for his high school, and in their league in California, you're going to be playing against some pretty good competition, well-coached offensive linemen, uh, and seeing some good offensive players. Uh, and so when you see him consistently, you know, obviously if you watch his huddle tape and if you're able to watch some of his game tape, you know, he flashes and he makes some plays, obviously, that go in the stat sheet, but then he makes some plays that don't show up in the stat sheet, which it, it obviously is appealing to a uh, Division One program or a defensive line. So right here, you, you saw him at the right side, now you see him on the left. So you, you, he's showing some versatility which is hard, you know, to play both sides of, of, of the line of scrimmage uh, as far as, you know, the defensive line position. But you see him right here, good hands, good violent hands, strong hands. Right here, he's able to keep his pads pretty square, throw them off pretty violent and get to the ball. And that's what you want as your defensive lineman uh, to do your job, but then obviously go and uh, get in on the play. So this is this is what you see right here. Good pad level, uh, good hands, good extension, good, good you know, little, lower base. Obviously, things are going to get better by getting coached uh, by uh, Terrence Knighton, but then also you like him to his ability to get off blocks. He's not velcroed on the blocks, and then he's going with a good angle into the ball. And uh, if he didn't make that tackle, it could be, uh, you know, somewhat of an explosive play because you see the first defender missed the tackle and he was there to make it. So you like to see when the when the tape is stopped. You like to see uh, uh, number fifty five either making the play or in the, in you know in the in the freeze frame, 
And, uh, you know, it's boding well. Again, you know, he's played primarily a four technique or a four eye technique or a five technique, depending on the on the defensive front. So when you try to portray it or try to, uh, um, you know, see where he fits in, you know, you, you can see right here the explosiveness right off the off the get go. Right. He comes off, shoots his hands, knocks the guy back, makes the play. And so when you're playing a three, three, five, you know, this is probably some of the fronts that you might see him playing. Right. A five technique. Plays with good hands, good leverage, good, you know, he looks like he has pretty good long arms and is able to get off the get off the ball and make the make the uh tackle for no either no gain or a very short gain. And so uh he has good uh levers, like what they're called, and that's a good, you know, good base right there, good strong base. You see him right now. His trunk and stuff, you know, obviously jumps off. And then you'd like to see that he has pretty good long arms to be playing either a four technique, a four eye technique, or a five technique. And he like his ability to shed blocks and, and make plays. And so that's what they're looking for. Guys that can play somewhat the techniques that they asked for early and then be effective, play in and play out. And then you see him here against a really good high school. I think it's matter day, right? So these are guys that when you play in these games, I think they're playing in, you know, a pretty big stadium. I think maybe San Diego State Stadium um, and the college or California, you know, high school playoffs. You're playing against Division One athletes there. I mean, these are the, these are the two programs right here. You see him playing a little bit of a three technique. Uh, and staying in his gap, right? Again, playing with good pad level, good good square pads, has his eye on the ball, right? And he's able to shed the block of 62 and make the play on, a, I'm assuming, a pretty good running back there. And so now you're seeing some position flexibility. Um, maybe they change up their scheme to go a little bit more of a four-man front, um, you know, and or maybe a shaded, you know, obviously right there, but you see him right there. He's able to do multiple, multiple, multitude of things, but the result's the same. And so that's what you look for when you're looking at a defensive lineman. What can he do? And how how many different things can you do with with being effective? And he looks like he's doing a, a lot of things right here, good on tape. Jay, when we're talking um, interior D line, you know the name the the techniques are thrown out a lot: zero technique, one technique, four four I. Just for the viewers at home who might not be familiar with that, can you maybe go through the yeah. the, the numbers and and um, kind of relate to where they actually line up uh, according to the offensive lineman? Yeah, so you just count, you know, zero would be, you know, head up on the, you know, the offensive lineman. And then uh, if you're in a one technique, you're shaded to the, you know, the side of the offensive line. And a two technique would be inside the guard. Three technique is head up on the guard. A wide three is kind of, if you want a reference, Warren Sapp, which made that, you know, famous in the B gap. And then your four eye technique is, is, is a little bit head up to inside of the offensive tackle. Five technique is, is head up straight up on the offensive tackle and six is a little bit outside uh shade or outside shade of the offensive tackle so right here can't really tell but looks like he's in a you know pretty much a three technique here yeah. um so now he's at you know sometimes a really good offense or a really good defense alignment can not only read the block ahead of him or the blocker in front of him but then the the open blocker that's adjacent from him so in this film right here he's playing more of a i would i'd say a five technique, right? And so mm -hmm. you, you can barely see the guard right there. He looks like a little bit smaller, but the, yeah. the tight ends to his side. So he's playing a five technique, head up on the offensive tackle. So he's initially reading the guy in front of him and possibly the guard. And so, you know, his ability to play with his hands is really, really helps him. So when you're able to play with your hands, that means you have good feet, which are going to obviously keep your shoulders and your feet square. So that's how he's able to make plays. And you see it all the time on his tape. As you see it right here when it, when it goes, Right here again, probably a little bit uh, five technique head up, maybe four. Get him off of him, throw him off, and able to get into the, get in on the run play there. And so it helps to be able to play with your hands, and that's what a lot of college coaches are looking for. Can you play with your hands, and can you make plays at multiple at multiple positions? And he's done uh, he's done that obviously by you know working at it, but then being coached well, and then you see it over and over and over in his tape. Uh, his ability to use his hands. He gets off the ball pretty decent, so he's pretty explosive out of his stance. Um, he's built pretty solid, obviously, you know, lower half. I mean, he's a big, big kid, mm -hmm. um, and he's in shape. So, you know, when they're coming from a program like like he comes from, that they know what it takes to work, right? The, the accountability is there, and he's he's been um, coached at the highest level of high school. And so his transition, hopefully, will be a little bit shorter or a little bit smoother than a, you know, a kid that maybe needs some work or refinement. Not saying that he's going to be in the starting lineup as a freshman, uh, but his ability to get on the field faster in, the, in either this year or years to come ideally will start from his uh, training in high school. And speaking of people getting on the field faster, I think interior D-line is, is something, is an area that you think the 
probably the coaches uh, need to keep looking in the transfer portal. Sure. I know there's going to be another opening later on in the season uh, after, after spring, but um, maybe just talk about what, what, what is in the room right now. We got Ty Robinson, Nash Hutmacher is coming back. Um, there's, there's bodies there, but not a ton um, depth wise. Right. So what, what do you see right now from the interior D line? Well, yeah, I mean, just that there's not a lot of experience and, and or depth. And so you got to think two years ago where Nebraska was six or seven deep, you know, Ty Robinson was a co-starter and just kind of getting his feet wet. And then last year, the emergence of Colton Feast and, and uh, you know, obviously Ty, that was a pretty good combination there. Uh, then Nash started to come on at the end of the season. Uh, but, you know, Colton Feast isn't back. Um, Nash, is, you know, needs to continue to get better. And then you have you know, a big hole as far as depth wise and a new defense, you know, you got Raquan Buckley that's shown some flashes, uh, but obviously he's right where everybody else is. You need Nash to take another step as far as his, you know, physically being in better shape, but then also, you know, applying it to the field, which you saw later on in the season, but depth wise, when you play a three man front, you ideally want to have five to six guys, seven at most or seven ideally. And so that's where you, you see them addressing the two biggest needs that, Coach Rule said in his first uh, introductory, you know, uh, press conference, but then obviously reality when he watched the tape, they needed some, you know, younger depth in the offensive line. Um, you know, obviously addressed it through the transfer portal in high school. Defensive line needed depth and and potentially playmakers. And so, you know, uh, you know, Coach Knight and, and uh, Coach Rayola, you know, got their work cut out for you, but they have tools that they've all been able to watch, see, and sign off on. So they, they as much as they have anxiety about, we got a bunch of new guys. I'm sure they're excited because these are guys that they're actually, you know, looking forward to coach along with the guys that are on the, on the roster. And so, you know, look, I, a good off season, which has started in January, we started January 1st, all the way to the season can change things immensely. Now it's up to the players and the coaches to find the combination of hard work, um, togetherness, accountability, and, and then production on the field. And it's there, there's a ton of opportunity. I know if I was a high school defense alignment, Nebraska come calling and I felt like I was good enough to play early. This is a place that I would be looking at um, now, obviously for selfish reasons, but obviously you don't get much better than Nebraska and you get a new opportunity with a new coach or a coaching staff. And so um, I'm sure that, you know, these guys are showing up with the hopes to get in there and be contributors. Ideally you wouldn't like, you don't want, you know, your freshmen to be your, you know, you don't want to have three freshmen out there starting. Yep. Um, unless they're like three JJ Watts, but you know, let's be honest, you know, that's not what's, you know, coming through the transfer portal or high school ranks, uh, right now for Nebraska. And so you'd like to have the guys that have the ability if they, you know, can play and play significant minutes to, to where they're able to develop along with play some, um, but you know, the guys on the present day roster really need to step up and that's Ty Robinson, Nash, um, uh, Raquan Buckley, and you can throw Judy in there too. He's played college football before Yeah, he's big enough. And so they're expecting him to, uh, transition to I'm assuming I can't speak for the coaches to possibly be a starter but if not then definitely a, you know a high rotational player as far as play wise and I another name that keeps escaping me and I don't know why but it's Stefan Wynn Jr. he's coming right. back and he's a guy that I think uh, gets for, forgotten about a little bit I just forgot about right now but I think he's kind of an interesting piece going uh, coming back for another year obviously a former Alabama guy Right. I think this is this is a that was a, that was a piece that Terrence Knighton might really um, be yeah. looking his chops to get his hands on and start um, you know fine tuning some things and maybe trying to pull out the talent that Stephon Wynn maybe had in high school and um, maybe showed flashes right. last year. Um, what what are your overall thoughts on Stephon Wynn Jr. Yeah, I gotta apologize. I kind of forgot about him. Yeah. I just kind of felt like him and Drew were seniors, but Drew was a senior and he had a couple of years, of, you know, two years of eligibility. So, I, you know, it's not that I was overlooking him. I just kind of lumped him in there with Drew because they came mm -hmm. in, in the transfer portal Me so too. late. Yeah. Um, but Stefan Wynn, obviously coming out of high school, was highly ranked. He has the size and strength and, and all the things that you need. You don't get a full ride to Alabama just because you're big. They have enough guys on their list that they can get big good guys and so there has to be something that was appealing to Alabama now it's up to him in particularly himself to take advantage of the opportunity now now you don't have to you know worry about Colton Feast that's been in the system before it's a coach that doesn't you know everybody's on the even playing field you have a tremendous opportunity and he and he does have some position flexibility of playing you know over the over the center which would be a zero technique or he can play a five technique so it's up to him to really take that step forward, not only to if I was him, it's my last year. I want to be a starter. 
And, yep. you know, whether it's starting and then, you know, him and Nash rotating together or being a starter in another position, it's something that he needs to take advantage of. And I think if he does, then that's how, like I talked about, you have a good off season, a new coach, and he's able to maybe bring something out of you that maybe that wasn't brought out of you before. Maybe there's some reality check to where you have, you know, some talks with yourself and say, man, I need to work harder. I need to be better. Um, and that needs to happen as well. Cause anytime that you, you know, haven't won as much as Nebraska uh, hasn't won, you know, you can't always point to the coaches or the weight program and all that. It's gotta be something that the players need to take advantage of. And so if he does it, you know, it, it'd be, you know, a pleasant surprise, but it wouldn't, shouldn't be a surprise uh, because he has the potential. It's not like he needs to gain 30 pounds or, you know, get two inches taller, which you, you know, obviously won't probably at this point in time. So he has all the things that you need uh, to be successful. Now he needs to go out and do it and it'd be a good opportunity for him if he has any aspirations and also to really cement himself. And he has a coach that has uh, NFL experience. And so hopefully, you know, some of those techniques can be appealing to him and then bring the best out of him. But it, you know, it's, it's definitely a two way street. And so, you know, the faster they get started on, you know, forging that type of relationship of getting the maximum out of the players and the coaching and the support staff, the defensive line can turn around and be pretty effective. Should be interesting. All right. So that will do it uh, for this edition of the black shirt breakdown, the Sua Lafotu black shirt breakdown, six foot four, 295 pounds from St. John Bosco out in California, three-star former Washington Husky commit. So he is Jay Foreman. I'm Steve Mark. And that was the black shirt breakdown. We'll catch y'all later.